some noise about uh, computational medicine and uh, there are two pillars of, uh, of SANO. One of them is definitely everything what is related to medicine, but computational means that we have a very strong uh, pillar uh, related to computation. And uh, in the contemporary world, you cannot do anything without uh, high performance computers. And uh, nowadays, high performance computers are going towards exascale computing. And we have a, a real expert in this area, uh, namely uh, uh, Professor Dietl Kranzmiller, uh, who is, uh, first of all, from, from the point of view of SANO, who is a member of uh, SANO International Scientific Committee. We are very grateful for him for this. And besides of this, he is a director of uh, 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 com uh, center in uh, 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 Leibniz Supercomputing Center, which is one of three largest uh, computer centers in in Germany, and he's also he uh, a professor at the uh, uh, LMU University in Munich, and uh, so he somehow puts together uh, uh, his. Uh, uh, challenges in uh, uh, science, in the research, together with organizing and running uh, one of the largest computer centers in, in Europe. So, uh, Peter, the floor is yours. Thank you for the nice introduction, Marian, and uh, dear colleagues, it's, it's a pleasure to be here today and to give this little talk that uh, Marian kind of forced me to do. Uh, I'll start immediately with what we talked about, the Leibniz Supercomputing Center, which is part of the Bavarian Academy of Sciences and Humanities. And Marianne, it's actually these 260 employees who, who do the work since 1962. So it, it's an old center in a sense. The building is not that old. Parts of the building were done in, in 2010, uh, parts in 2006. Uh, and uh, we have a number of different buildings here. It's just where the staff members are sitting. On the right-hand side, you see uh, the lecture rooms, you see a visualization center. And the key is, of course, here where all the computers are standing. This is about 10,000 square meters, 115,000 square feet. Uh, to, to be honest, Two thirds of it are needed for running the systems. Only one third is for the computers itself. And what I want to do today is I want to show you what we are doing as a service provider, or as it's called on this slide, the IT service backbone for the advancement of research and science. We do this on a number of different levels, starting from the Munich University through Bavaria, Germany, and Europe. And just to give you a glimpse on, on, on the size, one good indicator is this white boxes up here. So each of these white boxes is cooling 2.2 megawatts and uh, makes in total, we can go up to 10 megawatts at the moment, which means we are using somewhere between six and seven megawatts. And that is about 1000 euro uh, per hour on just electricity. Um, so there is, quite some investments in doing these things and running these systems. Now, let me start by first giving a little introduction of, of where we stand in Germany. Marianne mentioned the Gauss Center for Supercomputer, the National HPC Center, where we work with our colleagues in Stuttgart and Jülich. Uh, we are at home uh, near Munich, a little bit north of it. Uh, and that's the state, the, the free state of Bavaria. And as you see, the state has uh, a good characteristic in a sense that is, it is uh, a wealthy state and we have the political understanding about the importance of science and research. So up to the prime minister or rather down from the prime minister, uh, the government understands very well that we need to invest in science and research. And in that sense, we benefit from it. Of course, there are other things in Munich, which everybody knows, like this one, the uh, Oktoberfest, of course, but that shouldn't be the, the center of the talk today. Let me go a little bit more into the services that we are providing. So it's really in a, in, in a very broad uh, sense of services. We're starting from the Munich Research Network. So we're running the 
the network that connects all the research uh, institutions in, in, in and around Munich. Uh, that's about 570 buildings just from the two universities alone. That goes up to the Germany's highest mountain, the Zugspitze, where there is a research station. And of course, they need internet up there. We're also running things like the, the big data center or rather the digital archive of the Bavarian State Library, one of the top five uh, libraries with digitalization efforts, collecting everything that we have and preserving it as a digital image. And things like the virtual reality center, which would be nice to have everywhere around the corner, but which is maybe too expensive, but still needed for advancing science and research. I'll come to the supercomputer in a second, so let me spare that. Of course, there's many other things which I don't mention, like storage, cloud, clusters, and so on, uh, which just uh, assemble the, 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 feed, uh, the, the, the things that we provide as services. Most important, and that brings me back to Marianne's nice introduction, is the people that using this service doing their science. So it's, it's the people that actually drive uh, these needs and that tell us what they actually want to do. And in addition to running the services, what we do, we also do research and development. So research and development, not in competition with what the universities provide, but rather as an extension, as a, a continuous development and bringing new things from the universities and innovative ideas into uh, services so that things that are being developed research at the university now are future services at our center an example is here is our group on future computing which and that brings me back to politics that was introduced by the prime minister of bavaria uh, about uh, two years ago and that was really done as a group to research future architectures future technologies for things like artificial intelligence, big data, quantum computing. And again, we're doing this in collaboration and partnership with the universities, but it's the idea that once this is ready or say mature enough, we make it a service that everybody could be using. Now let's get to the supercomputer for a second. Uh, it's called SuperMOOC NG. So NG is next generation. It's actually the, the third version of the SuperMOOC at the moment. It's the current system that we are running consists of 6,480 nodes, uh, which boils down to 311,040 Intel Xeon Skylake cores, which together would give you a peak performance of almost 27 petaflops and puts the machine on uh, position 15 in the top 500. Now, the characteristics are interesting in a sense since this system doesn't have any accelerators, at least not in the core computing part, we do have GPUs in a cloud that is the front end node of that system. And we use these GPUs for pre and post processing. But for the large simulation task, we just have a pure Intel x86 architecture. Interesting is also the main memory with 720 terabytes, which is another characteristic of the system and its integration into the storage backbone. Now, the system itself is a production system, but still it is something where we put research in there because we want to see how we can operate it and we can operate it most efficiently. So we're doing things that are very interesting from an engineering task point, like cooling the system with hot water. So you see the regular boards somewhere hidden behind all these cooling uh, uh, circuits that are here, the cooling goes on top of the system and we can cool the processor. We can co use cooling water that is up to 45 degrees Celsius. So if you just compare the regular computing centers, what you have there, usually you use cold water with eight to 12 degrees Celsius. The other hot water systems use somewhere around 20, 21 degrees Celsius. Marian, I don't know what siphon it has. Maybe we can check that later in the, in the questionnaire. Uh, but we are going up to 45 degrees Celsius. And the idea is really that we use the outside heat to cool down the system uh, so that when temperatures are below 45 degrees Celsius, we need no energy at all to just uh, kind of be able to run the system. The engineering goes on, of course, with things like uh, 
Uh, this one, the cool manager that drives the water into the wrecks. We're using about 3000 liters of water per wreck at the moment. And there's plenty of interesting infrastructure in the double floor that allows us to make sure that uh, the system is cooled properly. Now, we do a number of things here, like also kind of uh, lowering the process of power consumption by going down with the cy clock cycle speed, uh, doing something like uh, making sure that there is a, a minimal number of fans in the system, uh, putting down limiting the maximum frequency and all these things. So these are problems which are interesting from a scientific point of view, also from a financial point of view. With all that, we save about 2, 000, uh, 2 million euros per year, which means 2 million euros per year, which are additional on the science and the research that we are doing so that can be spent on other things. And of course, there's many more interesting computer science research questions in there. Uh, I'll just mention the, the one here is the DCDB on the right hand side, which is a monitoring solution for really high resolution data to just understand all the sensors in the system, make sure that we can really kind of improve on the operation of the system. So with the SuperMOOC NG, we have a system that is in production, that is very powerful, that is used by scientists around the world in different collaborations. And of course, uh, it's interesting from the computer science point of view. Now I want to take a look at what other systems are there. And of course, if you take a look at that, you have to check out the last, the, the fastest machine on the planet, which is the supercomputer Fugaku in, at the Riken Center for Computational Science. Uh, so in contrast to our 3 million course, 300,000 cores, it goes up to 7 million cores and it provides a peak performance of more than half an exaflop. Also it comes with an electricity bill, which is three times as much as we could bring to the building. It goes up to 30 megawatts. And of course it is interesting from a number of aspects. Uh, I want to really focus here on just this computational aspect and bring it in uh, to see set the scene. In fact, if we take a look at the set the scene, we have to take this top 500 supercomputer list and go down the list to see some of the other systems like number two, the summit, the IBM system at Oak Ridge National Laboratory uh, and so on. The other, you see the top five here and all of them are powerful systems which are kind of ranked here by their performance uh, Rmux, which is how much, how many teraflops they achieve running the Lindpack benchmark as we all know. Now, this is a nice view on what's going on with the system. What we wanted to take a look at is what's coming up in the near future. Where are we with respect to the exascale market? So Marian mentioned the, the barrier coming to us and we expect some exascale systems uh, next year. Uh, and interesting, this slide here, which is from Hyperion Research and was given out at the SC20 virtual market update just last month. And they put together this list of systems that they know about, which are exascale or near exascale systems in 21 to 26. So in the next six years, you see approximately 30 systems in total with a value of about 10 billion US dollar in this case. So it doesn't really matter that much, but there is systems being installed which have this capability of running at the exascale level or at the near exascale level and providing this amount of performance. This brings us to politics, of course. And if we take a look at the previous European Commission president, Jean-Claude Juncker, uh, who said on, in October two, 2015, three years ago, that our ambition is that by 2020, Europe ranks in the top three HPC powers worldwide. Uh, I'm sorry about that. I don't think we will achieve that in 2020 anymore, uh, unless there is something super coming in in the next three weeks. But that was the goal. And of course, uh, following that goal, the European Commission initiated something called the Euro HPC Declaration, pushing HPC further. And doing this initiative really is the interest of making sure that Europe is kind of catching up to what the US and China and, and Japan have been doing. 
So Euro HPC is an ongoing endeavor where all this comes together. And I'd like to bring back the next statement from Kahil Ruana, who said that end of next year, Europe will have the number one, two, three supercomputers in the world. Well, again, this is from 2019, as you can clearly see here. And again, I think uh, it's, it's not the thing that is happening. Of course, there are things happening, and that's the pre-exascale and the exascale systems in Europe. So that's a slide which comes from this eurohpc.eu website, and it shows you the consortia which have been collecting together for pre-exascale or exascale systems. We noticed that Poland is in one in, of these uh, uh, important consortia with the Lumi system in, in, in Finland, which I think is a very interesting and, and good initiative. Uh, of course, there are all these others. So the countries have more or less decided, the member states have decided where to join and to make sure that we have this effort of going uh, into HPC, making sure that we're catching up with H exascale performance and so on. Now here, a little bit of a critical remark. I think, and that has been shown when we take a look back at, at, at statements like uh, having the number one, two or three supercomputers in the world. I think there are two my fundamental flaws and that's more or less the core of my talk. First of all, uh, I don't think it matters where we are on the top 500. We don't need systems which are one, two, three on the top 500. We need systems that deliver exascale performance for excellent science. I think that must be the goal. And that does not actually build with what you have on the top 500. The other thing is, even if we have these exascale system and the pre-exascale systems, we should not forget it's not about just those applications which can run on the full system providing full exascale capability. It's rather that we will have many applications in between going up and down the scale and making sure that they can use this performance that we are providing as efficiently as possible. So the goal must be, and that's what I'm very strongly ad advocating for, is the science that we are providing, the science that we are delivering. That's the goal for HPC, and that's what we want to achieve with this system. And that comes in different flavors, just four different examples on that slide here. One is, of course, to increase the knowledge base, to increase uh, humans' capital in understanding the world. The other one is, of course, economy, where it comes in. To think of it, the numbers of each of these autonomous cars on the streets is delivering one terabyte of data each day. Just to make sure that we can control fleets, we will need HPC systems. We also see that the environment today, and just the corona pandemic is one, we have floodings, we have extreme events. So we also need to make sure that HPC is used for environmental sciences, make sure that it helps our society. And then of course there is, and that's why systems or centers like the Sano Center are so important because it really helps the things that concern everybody of us, life science and all that where medical comes in. Let me start with some applications that are really uh, very much scientific applications. And that's one example that has been running on our system. It's a large turbulence flow and it's actually showing the birth of stars. So it has a turbulence simulation, the world's largest turbulence simulation, which was not run on one of these uh, big uh, near exascale system, but it was run on our system. And it was possible because the scientists optimized the code so this is the largest computational fluid dynamics simulation. And it really shows us new insight into how stars are formed. Of course, I was very happy to see that this uh, even made it to the big screens at the supercomputing conference. And again, that's just a, a byproduct. The interesting thing is that people have been developing software that is running in order to make sure that they understand how this interesting uh, features or this interesting knowledge is being operated. So the goal at the Leibniz Supercomputing Center is more or less reflected on that slide. It's to make sure that all these different applications get what they need for their particular codes. You won't find LINPACK in that list. Of course, I do not exclude that some parts of uh, solving linear equations 
will be in all of these applications, but it's not the goal that we want to do Limpec, but it's rather the goal that we want to make sure that each of these application domains can work with it. And I'm just bringing up one of the books we did, which is this, you can download, you can get your digital copy of it. That's the last one in 2018. We're working on the 2020 book, and that book shows the application. It's uh, on the previous SuperMOOCs. It does not include SuperMOOC NG. It's just SuperMOOC 1 and 2. And we had 820 research projects being carried out, 9.5 billion compute hours consumed for science in that interest. And of course, uh, I could just give you the number for SuperMOOC NG. We spent from the, since since we started the system to now about 3.5 billion of compute hours already. So the system is massively being used, and there is interesting information on our webpage and all these things. So why are we doing it? What is it really we want to achieve? We didn't go up in the top 500 as much as we could because that was never our goal. Our goal is more things like this one. This is science projects, or rather the title page of the science magazine with two projects that have been carried out on our system. And I'm just using this as work from Alexandro Stamatakis from the Scientific Computing Group at the Heidelberg Institute of Theoretical Studies. And he was more or less developing phylogenetic trees for insects on the right-hand side and uh, uh, birds on the left-hand side. And he did this for 150 insects. And actually he knew, he developed the code, he knew what the code would need. And only when SuperMOOC uh, arrived, was he able to run the code. So we have scientists waiting for the machines to be capable enough to do their research and then come up with solutions, which then end up on title pages of uh, things like Science Magazine and show how important that research is. Again, there is interest of course also from the computer science point of view. Now here is an example where we had another so-called world record because that's a, project, a production code on seismic wave propagation. So what you see here is one of the volcanoes. And with that code, we were able to achieve 1.4 petaflops on the old SuperMOOC. And that was 44% of peak performance. That is production code. And that is fantastic from a computer science point of view. Now, this is code is fully optimized. And that is really taking every possibility of getting performance out of the system. But it is far from the LINPEC version of the codes. Yeah? So we are not, we're, we're much, we're, we're achieving about 50% of the peak performance. And we were very happy about that because regular codes are around 10% or even lower than that. And these scientists are really credited. They are credited for the science they are doing. One example is Alice Agnes Gabriel, who won the 2020 Praise Ada Lovelace Award this year. And she's one of these scientists working in uh, seismology and investigating tsunamis and earthquakes. And she is not interested, she doesn't get any benefit from the top 500 position, but she needs these systems to make sure that she is able to do her research. Here's another example from the same area, from the same domain, uh, something that looks trivial in the video on the, on the right-hand side, but it's more interesting when you take a look on the left-hand side. So uh, we're simulating that the uh, depth and temperature dependent viscosity in the mantle of the Earth. And we see in the simulation how the Earth formed out of this original one continent. Uh, we're going back here in time. You see how the continents are moving closer together uh, to about 200 million years ago. And that simulation is again interesting because it helps these scientists to understand the movements of the tectonic plates and also how uh, the, the Earth's mantle is actually working. You also see it's producing quite some amount of data, 12 terabytes per simulation. Right now we are at 30 terabytes per simulation. And again, there are many, many interesting facets in there. One is that this application has removed all the matrices in the computation. So it's a matrix-free code that runs here and then is being able to again go to the maximum of the performance that the system gives us. 
So this is again interesting from the science part of view. And this again uh, made it even into the American Museum of Natural History in New York City. You see here this uh, ball. This is our planet. This is actually a 3D print with about one meter in diameter that was made from the simulations that we did. And you see it here standing behind the group of people in this David and Ruth L. Gottesman Hall of Planet Earth there. And it, it shows how we kind of advance science, then give it back to society so that they can understand. Even closer are simulations that we did with the Climax project, which assesses the effects of climate change on hydrological extreme events. So here's a flooding on one of the German freeways where you see these, these trucks cannot move anymore because they are way underwater. And Ralph Ludwig and his group was investigating how we could, how will the climate crisis affect extreme events in Bavaria? So we also use the visualization and virtual reality center here. So you see people more or less moving on top of Bavaria, trying to understand the simulation data. Interesting with this application is that Ralph Ludwig was not an HPC user four years ago. We met by accident at one of these events, which shows again how important it is to go to events and drink beer there and meet people. And I talked to Ralph and asked him, so what are you doing? He said, oh, I'm studying extreme events caused by the climate crisis. And I said, oh, that's interesting. You must be using our HPC system. And he said, no, I didn't know I could use them. So within four years, we brought him up from zero to one of the power users of the system. And he generated about 7,500 simulations that help us understand the effects of climate change and climate crisis. So what we want to do is, and that's the goal for our center, we want to really give this back to a broad range of users. We want to understand the requirements and we want to support application with different requirements. So it's not so much about how many GPUs you have in the system, it's rather how much science can we do, how much can we kind of advance science. And there's many things that you bring in here, uh, goes with things like uh, the integration of new domains, but also the consulting and the partnership with the application domains, but also extensive education and training systems. So, uh, we really want to make sure that these systems are being used for all these different domains, and that's the goal why we are building these systems. So that sounds all very relaxing. So let's sit down for a moment, enjoy this scenario, think about it. So I've shown you mostly applications from domains outside of uh, what Sano Center is interested. Let's take a closer look. What happens if we want to apply this to medical sciences? And I want to really open up the window and see, oh, it's a little bit bigger than we thought before. Well, actually, I think it is quite a cliff that we have to uh, get uh, over with. And the, the cliff, I think, and that's what I want to show you, is mostly not in getting exascale performance. And it's certainly not in getting GPUs. Uh, so the questions I want to address in this third part of the talk is how can we use exascale class systems for computational medicine? And an important aspect here is in order to do that, we need to process sensible biomedical data on exascale class systems or smaller HPC systems. So what do we need to do for that? And then the question, of course, do we need exascale class systems for computational medicine? Uh, in fact, how does that work? Let me first start with one project where uh, we have not been in from the beginning, but we churned only in the second phase. That's the CompiMet 2 Center of Excellence. You see a number of core partners there, of course. You see how that is connected. And there is, of course, other supercomputing centers like our colleagues in the Netherlands, for instance. Now, the goal of that project is to advance the role of computational based modeling and simulation within medicine. And to do this by involving three different user communities, academics on the one hand side, industrial partners on the other hand, and then clinical researchers. And what we wanted to do is we wanted to understand how we could build, develop, and extend these capabilities to make sure that we're utilizing the high performance computers. 
Now the goal of that project is different. So you have the Molecular uh, problem domain, you have the cardiovascular problem domain and the neuromuscular skeletal problem domain. Now I'm not a medical person. Let's just put this on the side and remember that's what we want to do. What I'm interested in is could we use things like SuperMOOC as a tool to help these scientists? And doing that is our target question was, for instance, can we use genomic data from individual candidates, which is real patients, and predict whether a standard drug for the treatment of breast cancer will help or not? Now, again, don't take me wrong. I'm a computer scientist, not a medical scientist. But the question for us is interesting to solve because we need HPC systems for that. So the colleagues and the medical experts in the project came and said, we wanted to estimate which of the drugs works best for a certain patient which suffers from breast cancer. So the goal was for us a demonstration of the feasibility of using the power of high performance computing. And the key questions are, can we help to address the question above for the scientists? However, also, can we use IT infrastructures for these questions and how are we using them? Can we potentially detect bottlenecks or problems we have with IT infrastructures today? And can we derive a workflow which would allow us to utilize such HPC systems in daily operation for addressing future similar questions? So what we did is we put together an experiment on, again, SuperMOOC phase one and two shown here in the picture, trying out 100 target binding affinities and that resulted in a nice project where we did the stocking simulation for about 37 hours in total. So we started on Friday afternoon and we told them you can now have the system until Monday morning. Uh, the group of experts was working 37 hours around the clock using the, at this time, 240,000 cores, consuming about 9 million CPU hours and producing five terabytes. Monday morning, we put the system back into regular operations. They were accessing the five terabytes and analyzing the simulation results. So I think in total, it was about six patients that were simulated. So that just shows you the immense amount of power we need to do that. But the interesting thing was that these terabytes included lots of data, lots of results that are important to produce. So. About uh, lunchtime on Monday morning, uh, Peter Coveney here in the picture together with a bottle of champagne, which he sponsored to my team, uh, came back and said, this is fantastic. There's so much information in that data, which we can use for our publication, which we can use for advancing science. So we had two positive effects here. We first helped to advance science and we had this bottle of champagne, which was also very welcome. Now the point here is that this is only one result of the project. There are other simulations results. This one is a nice video showing really the circle of willies. So this is a part of the arterial tree in the brain. And just this simulation, this couple of seconds needs thousands of cores for a couple of hours just to produce this uh, realistic blood flow simulation. And again, it shows how much power we need and it shows that we need exascale systems as they are coming. Now, coronavirus has shown us some more things and the project Compimate is also investigating corona. Uh, so the, the idea here was that we are screening a large database of known drugs for the binding to proteins. And we did that again on SuperMOOC NG. The binding free energy is determined by kind of monocular dynamic simulations. And that really deals in with today and what we want to do. And the idea is that in the end, we can, from this huge mass of possibilities, reduce to those which are really studying in vitro. Huh? And again, to give you a number, that project has consumed just between uh, May and today, uh, 49 million of core hours, just simulating this one particular thing. And there's many more projects going on where HPC helps with the coronavirus. Now, the good thing about the coronavirus is it doesn't have any rights. There is no e EU data protection rights for the coronavirus, nothing that uh, we need to protect here. Of course, it's different when we talk about the humans. 
involved in here. But the good thing is everything I've shown you so far has been done with anonymous data and in that sense, insensitive data, we could just do that. Now we all know there is a caveat here with the K anonymity of the anonymous data. Again, the virus doesn't have any rights here, so no, no problem. But what we really want to do and what uh, I think the, the SANO Center is also interested in is going much closer to clinical data or at least use pseudonymized data, which is de-identified and then is able to do research in the interest of some particular uh, patients. So the goal is we want to deal with any of these data and we need to make sure that we take data security and privacy seriously. So data itself, and again, I'll, I'll, I want to make a short side remark here because in Germany, we have an initiative on research data, the National Research Data Infrastructure or in German, the NFDI. And the goal of that one is to make sure that data itself or just managing the data is, is easier and allows us to provide long-term storage, backup accessibility, and all these kinds of things. So NFDI is investing in that area, addressing the needs of the researchers, facilitating easy access, and then fostering sustainability. And Germany is investing about 85 million euros per year into this uh, in initiative, making sure there's project funding for at least 10 years. So this is good. And, and, and this is one of the bases. So let's assume we have access to enough storage. So the question now for the users is, if we have access, if we have the hardware, what do we need to do? Now, what we did is we started a number of projects. This is one of them called Digimed Bavaria. You see a number of interesting uh, project partners in there, like the German Heart Center. Of course, you understand what their uh, research interest is in. And we wanted to see if we could develop an integrated digital research platform for really medical or clinical use cases. Developing all the storage and compute services and then putting it together with an integrated security concept so that really we get that in. And of course, all that in the interest of making sure that we have this blueprint for follow-up projects. So if we take a look at the technical aspects of the project, uh, doing integrated system level security, well, that's computer science per se. We know how to do it. We know security privacy by design. We have ideas on data economy, things like the need to know principle. And I'm not going through here. This, these are things where computer scientists say, we know how to deal with that. Also storage and computation. Well, we need to understand what kind of data sets are we talking about? Many small files, large chunks, how we are doing the backups, how are we doing the data hosting? Again, as computer people, this is just like any other project. We have to sit down, we have to think hard about it, we get up with concepts. And again, we had a concept here for that solution. So we have a virtual IT infrastructure, which we call the high assurance scientific data analytics as a service infrastructure that allows our medical experts to work with that and have all these tools at hand. Now, the problem is, and that gets us back to our question, can we use these systems? The problem is there are non-technical aspects which we have to address. Sometimes there are legal aspects. So that's what I want to focus here just for a moment. The EU General Data Protection Regulation. And just to, as, as a warning here, I'm a big fan of that. I think it is good that we have it. It gives us some, some power as users but of course, it also introduces special obstacles that we have to address when doing sciences. One is Article 9, where we are processing special categories of personalized data. Uh, we need to take precautions here if we are dealing with this data. And we see, of course, there is personal data involved when we talk about medical data. Another one is Article 32, uh, which talks about security of processing. And again, we need to make sure that all these aspects in these legal requirements in these frameworks are there. There's also the interesting case that we have regional requirements. For instance, the Bavarian hospital law, for instance, that is mentioned here, which says that patient data may only be collected and stored if it's necessary, clear need to know, but also it's only allowed within the hospital. 
It's not allowed to move the data out of the hospital. Unfortunately, the hospital doesn't have a supercomputer. So we have to find ways and solutions for that. And we have been dealing with that in our project here, talking to the medical practitioners and the medical scientists. And just the legal question, who is responsible, accountable for the security of the data set is not easy to answer for uh, neither the medical expert nor the computer science expert. What are the organizational guidelines, the policies that we have to adhere to? What are the requirements, the expectations? And we had these discussions with the medical experts and they take quite some time. So again, centers like the Sano Center will can provide some input here by just bringing the people together. We also deal with that and we made this data processing agreement that mentions our technical and organizational measures. So, so LRC is certified according to ISO 27001, which means we have a certain IT security certification. But that doesn't help you if the medical expert needs to understand what that means for his everyday work and for the infrastructure. There's also the question, could we just ask the Bavarian Data Protection Officer? Well, reality is, it's not a deal to, to do compliance approval. It's the deal to find out if somebody is violating the rule. So there's also kind of a, a difficulty to find the right persons to talk to. And that needs to be coming together. So this project is running for about two years now. And about one and a half years, we were just able to address these problems and make sure that the scientists, the medical scientists understand that it's not us trying to avoid them. So getting back to our cliff and where we stand, I think uh, the question, what do we need to process this sensible data has been addressed. But there's also the question of course, how can we use the exascale systems when they become, once they become online? And that's of course, many of the questions that are still in the making. Again, take this one example, which I took again from the Hyperion research results. If you just look at the barriers for using on-premise HPC systems, there is the lack of knowledge of the experts, the skilled HPC technical computing support stuff. And it's hard to hire these people because they are very valuable. They are very much used also around the industry here, of course. There's also uh, the ease of use issues uh, that we have to do, and then the programming hurdles that we have to deal with with hybrid environments. So these things have to be addressed when we want to go to these, these systems. So luckily there are solutions for that. And we're very happy that we have been working together with a couple of friends, some of them on the, on the call here, like our friends from CypherNet, of course, where we worked in process on exactly that solution. How can we provide the technical tools for using exascale service platforms with data and computational services for the future? And we just had the review of that project last week, and that was kind of concluded with excellent results. And again, it underlines what I've been saying before. It's not just about we want to have those exascale applications which run at the full size of an exascale system. We need to make sure that we are along the line from today's performance all the way up and down again, and that we are providing modular solutions that we can use for these systems. So that's one example. And there was this talk by my colleague, Maximilian Hoop, who told you about these exascale ready ecosystems, which was addressing that particular thing. So next question is then, of course, do we need exascale class systems for computational medicine? I was hoping I don't need to answer that question anymore because there have been enough examples where we see that there's much more performance needed than we get from these systems today. And I expect that we will go beyond exascale in many areas and life science is certainly one of that. Again, I, I'd like to bring up one simple key slide, which I find important. Again, from Hyperion Research, and they were kind of talking about the return on investment. For every dollar that you invest in HPC, there is $463 in revenue. For every dollar of cost saving, uh, there is $44 in profits, yeah? So using HPC can make up financial profits. And I have to admit, I'm a scientist. The financial profits is nice for some 
people in some domains. What I find most interesting is where HPC helps us with our applications, where it helps society and where it puts all that together. So I'm coming to a conclusion. I hope I was able to kind of underline the importance of HPC approaching the exascale barrier, how we can deal with it. I mentioned that the goal is application performance. It's not top 500. Let me just make one more comparison here. Top 500 is nice, but it's more like the Formula One race on Sunday. We like to watch it. We want to know who is the winner. <laughs> but if you want to move your household to your new apartment or to your new house, then you don't need a Formula One car. You need a very powerful uh, truck or bus that helps you move that thing. And that's exactly the thing that we see here. And finally, I think we have for computational medicine also many non-technical challenges, which we shouldn't forget, which we have to address. And I hope that things like the Sano Center will also help in here, help us to see how that works forward. And I wish all the colleagues uh, good luck with that. It's an important work that you're doing. And thank you everybody else for your attention. Thank you, Maria. Uh, Dieter, many thanks for, for, for this uh great overview what is going on in high performance computing in uh, in the way to exercise computing and about all these challenges which are uh, for computational medicine uh, 